tonight we have a Dr. Rodney Clarkin uh, to speak about life after life, the journey of the soul. He is uh, a professor emeritus from Northern Michigan University, where he served as head of the School of Education. His early experience in Native American and Tanzanian schools influenced his outlook. For more than 40 years, he has worked in education with focus on developing human potential. He served at the Baha'i World Center from 2012 to 2019 and is currently a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Virgin Islands. And uh, there, is, um, there is a link for his work. I can put it in the chat, rodclarken.wordpress.com, including books, papers, presentations, study material, and art. He is currently writing a book on realizing our potential and purpose. Thank you so much, Rod, for accepting mm. being here with us tonight, and please go ahead. Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you all. Uh, my heart goes out to the person who had dengue, because I had that a month or two ago, and it was not fun. So I hope uh, you're better. I see you there now, yes. <laughs> it's not fun. So uh, tonight we want to talk about life after life, the journey of the soul. I originally, when I talked to Farouz, I, I suggested life after death, but and, and I also gave her some alternative titles. I think people are a bit uh, hesitant to, to talk about death, especially in North America. In fact, uh, where I lived in North America at the University of, of uh, Northern Michigan, I was actually further north than most of the um, population of Canada. So, and the people where I lived actually were teased by the rest of the state. We're in the upper peninsula of uh, Michigan and we had more of a Canadian accent. And so, uh, we were always getting teased, and our, we had our own model. Uh, the model for Michigan was say yes to Michigan. And the model for the Upper Peninsula was say, say ya yeah to the UP, eh? And so I feel quite close to uh, my colleagues in, uh, in Canada. But now, of course, I'm living in the Virgin Islands uh, in the Caribbean. I had pioneered here uh, in the 80s and was a professor at the university here. And um, when I uh, was asked to come to the World Center, I retired early from my position as the head of the School of Education at Northern Michigan uh, University and went there and ended up staying there for seven years and, and doing research and service there. And when I, 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 quite frankly, I wasn't, I didn't really, I wasn't looking to go to the World Center. I thought my work and my service as the head of a school of education was probably the best service I could do. But after three years of back and forth with the World Center, they convinced me that they knew more than I did. And so I, I chose to go, uh, thinking that, you know, it will be a sacrifice for me because um, I, but I had such a blessed life. I had lived in Africa, I lived in Europe, I'd lived in Asia, uh, and I pioneered all over the world with the faith. And I thought, I have such a blessing I can sacrifice this time just for God. And uh, went and it was the happiest time of my life. And as a result of that, I thought, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life full time serving the faith. 
And so when I left um, the World Center in the Holy Land, I went to Croatia, Slovenia, to China, spent some time in India. And each of those places is seeing if this is where I could best use my uh, be of service to God and humanity. And in the end, I um, came back here to the Virgin Islands, which uh, has been a real blessing and uh, a, an ideal place, I think, for me to serve. So one of the things that um, I was doing in the World Center was researching different topics and such. And while I was there and in my free time, I've always been interested in compiling the writings. I compiled uh, about 700 pages of quotations on different topics related to releasing potential and realizing our purpose. Um, and have recently started using those notes to put together a book uh, which is well coming on its way. And uh, some of the articles uh, related to that book have been published on Teachings.org. if you're interested. Uh, one of the topics that is of most interest to me, and it partly is because I just turned 73 a couple of weeks ago, is uh, what happens to us after we die. And uh, part of my focus on writing this book actually comes from uh, a series of dreams my daughter had uh, back in January of this year. And in those dreams, uh, which kept recurring, uh, it was quite clear that I was being called to um, to a higher realm. And we both kind of interpreted that uh, it might be uh, the time for me to go someplace else as into the next world. And so that kind of gave me the stimulus of thinking that each day could be my last day, which is a very powerful uh, stimulant. And it very helps you focus, helps you helps you kind of judge what am I doing today? If if today was my last day, how would I best use it? And uh, so this has partly given me the focus and the energy to kind of do this work. One of the things that uh, is is very important is that when we transition from this world, we are actually going to enter another world. And so I have spent a lot of time from early, yeah, I, I've been a Baha'i almost 60 years. Uh, I have spent a great deal of time trying to understand who we are as human beings, primarily who am I, what is my purpose, and then how do I become my true self and realize my purpose. Very briefly, uh, to kind of give us some context, who we are, we have a body, which you can see, you can actually, the light is coming off the, the, my face, going into the camera, going through the wires, and you're seeing it. But that is not my essence. That's just my body that I am inhabiting or I'm associated with my soul is associated with while I'm in this world. I am essentially, my true identity is a soul. And so the other thing I've tried to do, and as I just scan the screen here of everybody's uh, faces, is to just look at everyone, to look past whatever their physicality is and to see them as a soul, as a creation of God. And that has helped me to, to, I think, overcome some un, unconscious kinds of biases and stereotypes and prejudices that I've had. And um, something that I have tried to do over my lifetime, but at this 
each time I, I try to get better and better at it. So talking about the journey of the soul, let's start at the very beginning. The soul starts at conception. And we don't know much about the soul, uh, but we know more than any other people have at any other time in history. If you read other religious literature, their descriptions and the understanding you can get of the soul, first of all, they, they barely mention it. Uh, and secondly, it's not described. The Baha'i writings have given a very rich and thorough description. But in that description, they've made it very clear that no matter how much and how far we understand the soul, we can never understand it. They kind of compare it to understanding God. It is beyond human comprehension to understand the soul. One of the vehicles that we have to help us understand the soul is the use of metaphors. And the uh, Baha'i writings, as the writings of Plato and Socrates and other religious figures, suggests that this world mirrors the next world. And so the laws and happenings in this world are mirrored in that next world. And so I'm going to be primarily trying to explain uh, the soul by use of metaphors, comparing our soul and its development to the development of our bodies. And to do that, uh, we start at conception. When our bodies are conceived, you could actually say in some ways there was no pre-existence for that body. It's when the egg and the sperm unite that the DNA then combines and the potential then for a human being, a human body comes into being at that point. And then that soul begins, that body begins dividing, subdividing, and so on. And those initial cells are what are called stem cells, and they can turn into any cell they want to be. I compare that then, Baha'u'llah said that this world is as different to the next world as the world while we were in the womb of our mothers is to this. So when we were in the wombs of our mothers, we were also in this world, although we weren't conscious of it because we had that thin member membrane of skin and the womb that kept us from experiencing this world. But we were in it, we just weren't conscious of it. The people in this world were conscious of that embryo developing in the mother's womb, but it was not conscious of it. This is similar to our souls developing in this world. We are developing also in the womb of this world. This world is the womb for our souls to develop, just like the womb of our mothers was for our bodies to develop. And our bodies become, are like the placenta to the body. These bodies take in all of the nutrients and such from the world and help our soul then to develop. This body is not who we are. This body is the placenta, which feeds our soul and which our soul can then interact with the world. It's through this body that our soul develops and our soul is able to uh, release its powers back into the world. And so we are in this constant state of development in this world, but also not realizing, like when we we're in the womb of our mothers, that we we're also in that next world as well. Those people or those souls in the next world can see and understand us and interact with us and actually help us very much like the people can help, uh, you know, our mother can help us, our fathers and, 
and all of the people who surround them can help us develop in our womb, those souls in the next world can help our souls to develop in this world. They are conscious of us. We have no way of looking at them or being uh, consciously connected with them. Much like when we were in the womb of our mothers, we were developing all of the organs, our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our hands, and all our legs, everything we needed in this world. But we actually could not use them in that world. Not only could we not use them, we weren't even really conscious of these capacities when we were in our mother's womb. But the whole purpose of our being in our mother's womb is to go from that one cell creature and in nine months, we go through billions of years of evolution. We have uh, gone from a one cell creature into a human being. And we go through all the various stages of being a germ, a worm, a fish, whatever, all those stages. And we emerge as human beings because it is the ideal environment for our bodies to develop all the capacities they need for this world. They can't use those capacities. If you try to use your eyes or your mouth, or you try to breathe in that world, you will damage yourself. You, they are meant to be used here in this world. And so when we, and we, and we have no consciousness, if we could actually see if we were in that world and we could see what this world was like, we would long to leave that world and be in this world. Because all of a sudden, all of these things that we were created for become uh, manifest. They become useful. We're, we're no longer constricted. We're no longer uh, blind and, and deaf. You know, we can hear a little bit in the womb, it's like muffled sounds. We can, if they shine light outside of the um, uh, womb, uh, the, the baby can orient to it. We can move our arms and legs a little bit, but we are very, very much limited. Likewise, our souls in this world have to operate within the womb of this world, and it is very limited just like the womb of the mother is a dark and constricted place. For our souls, this is a dark and constricted place. But as we journey through here, we our essential requirement is not to live for this world. Our essential requirement is to prepare ourselves to die from this world and to be born into the next. And so that when we are born into that world, we will have all of the spiritual qualities we need in that, in that process. So that process in, in the womb of our mothers, how do we know what to develop and what, how, how we should go about that? Well, within our DNA is like an instruction manual. And in that DNA, there are thousands of genes. They figure... 19 to 25,000 genes. Now, what happens is every cell in our body has the same DNA in it. My fingernail cells, my eye cells, my brain cells, my heart cells, they all have the exact same DNA that came from that same single cell that we started with. What happens is that DNA gets expressed to say, okay, this cell is going to become a brain cell. This one will become a fingernail cell. Each cell gets triggered to develop the certain qualities that it needs for that part of the body. And to use that analogy, I think we also in this world, our souls, the, the instruction manual for our souls is in there as well. But how do we know what to, uh, what to manifest? 
how do we know this should become an eye cell, this should become a brain cell and a fingernail cell, whatever. We, we have to then look to uh, the instruction manual from God, which comes to us through the word of God. The word of God then gives us instructions to say, okay, these cells here, you're going to become eyes and these cells here, fingernails. And so there's a, you know, the qualities you're going to need spiritually for the next world, just as your body was knew the qualities and knew what to develop at different places at different times so that it could function and be healthy in this world. So all of what happens is they're at different stages in our embryonic development, we get signals and triggers that say, okay, now develop this, now develop that. These genes should express themselves, these genes shouldn't. What happens in this world by our being exposed to the word of God and being exposed to the changes, chances and trials and tests of the world, our virtues, which become the eyes and ears and all the various attributes, the virtues of our soul are the attributes of our soul get triggered to develop. So this person may trigger me to develop patience and love and someone, you know, my, I try to develop truth and, and to be fair. Each test, which we sometimes think, oh, why am I having all these tests, are all opportunities. They're all gifts really from God to say, you need to develop this here because you're really going to need it there. And in the same way that you might think, well, why am I developing eyes in the womb? Uh, I don't want to be bothered with these tests. I want to just float around and stay as a stem cell. That's okay if you do that and, and you stay in that world. But as soon as you're born into the next world, you're going to be missing all of those spiritual attributes that you're going to want and desire there. And so heaven and hell, as described in uh, our different different ways that life after death is described in different religions is not so much going to be uh, some being punishing us or rewarding us saying here, it's going to be our reward is, is going to be all of the attributes that we carry with us. And our punishment is going to be the attributes we fail to develop and therefore do not have them. So if you were if you take that metaphor back to the embryo and say, well, I'm talking to you in the embryo, you should develop eyes and ears, let's say. And the embryo says, I'm just happy floating here. I can't use eyes and ears here. They're they're worthless to me. Why, why would I do that? Um, that's not a problem there. But once you're born, that's when your heaven and hell happens. If you developed all of the physical, uh, and all the capacities and all the qualities you needed for this world, then this world is going to be more of a heaven. But if you fail to develop them, it's going to be more of a hell. So as people know from my uh, talks in the past, I don't like to lecture. I don't like to speak too long. I, and we do, we have, I, I like to have a conversation. Uh, I like to, I was a teacher. I like to uh, speak to the, the interests of the students as you, one of the sayings that is, was quoted by in the Baha'i writings. It's an old tradition that goes, not everything that a man knoweth can be disclosed, nor can everything that he disclose be can regarded as timely, nor every timely utterance be considered as suited to the capacity of the hearer. So I want to know what's timely to you and what your capacity it would like to for us to talk about because this is a very broad subject and we can go many different ways.
And you can type in your things in the chat if you want to raise your hand. You can do that. Um, if you if you want to just come on, uh, you can do that. I'm going to let Farouz be the moderator, though I'm I can't. Uh... I just wanted to uh, to mention that we have a few guests tonight. And okay. They uh, they are the people who are going to ask questions. They are given priority. If they're All right. friends, they're more than welcome either to put it in the chat or whatever. But uh, but we would like to to respect our guests tonight. Okay. So you're more than welcome to ask any question. If you want, you can put it in the chat. I can read it uh, for Rod or you can uh, address the. So. Uh, Dr. Mushrif Zadeh. Uh, put a question in the chat. If there is no more questions, I can read it. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, is the belief in Baha'u'llah necessary for a person to achieve their human potential? Uh, to achieve their full potential, yes. Um, I think we can talk a bit about that uh, because it is um, something that is is worth exploring a bit. We are basically have animal bodies. And within these animal bodies, which is unique in, in creation as we know it and in, in this world, this earthly world, we have been uh, given souls. And one of the verses of Baha'u'llah says, veiled in my immemorial being and in the ancient eternity of my essence, I knew my love for thee. Therefore, I created thee, have engraved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty. I'd want to just take a moment to explore that in, in terms of answering this question. Uh, the Baha'i belief is that there is an immemorial being and it's an ancient eternity of essence. We cannot know that being. There's no way for us to access it. That being is so far beyond us. It'd be like a plant trying to communicate with us. They're, they're too far uh, away for us to have any comprehension of them. And so that immemorial being knew its love for us Therefore, it created us. So first of all, that explains how we came, how this creation came to be. Uh, within Islam, there is this idea of I was a hidden treasure and, and desired to be known. Therefore, I created a man to know me. Uh, it's a similar kind of story. So he says then in that verse that, and this verse is from Baha'u'llah, it's in his Arabic hidden words. Uh, in that verse he says, and I have engraved on thee mine image. In that he's saying that your soul is, man has the capacity, has the, is in the image of God in the image of this immemorial being, this ancient eternity of essence, which we can never know, but we can get to know our own selves, which has been kind of the dictum or been one of the wisdoms that has been passed down throughout the ages is to know thyself. And I think to the extent that you know yourself, your true self, that image of God, that we are now calling the soul to be to kind of simplify that but that image that soul that spiritual essence that's in us has it it can reflect all the attributes of god and that makes humans unique and so god not only gave this those capacities but then he revealed to us uh the his beauty which is the last part of that quote 
I have engraved on thee mine image, which means we're created in the image of God, and revealed to thee my beauty. So now we can, we can see the image of God within us, and we can see the revealed beauty of God within us. We can also see the revealed beauty of God within creation. But God has also, when you read other verses, has revealed his essence and guidance to the extent that we can extend, understand it through various teachers, messengers, prophets, educators, different terms we can use, but holy, unique souls that have come at a very few times in human history to help humankind to understand the image of God to the extent they can, and to reveal the image of God to the extent that we have the capacity, that it is not everything that God knoweth can he disclose, nor can everything that he disclose be considered as timely. So when he does find it timely, then he reveals it. But it also has to be suited to the capacity of the hearer. And the hearer throughout history has, their capacity has grown over time, just like our capacity grows as an individual. We have, as an infant, our capacity to know, to understand, to do things is pretty much void. We, we come here with a lot of potential, but basically very little capacity we begin developing that capacity. We begin hearing vibrations in our ears and seeing light waves coming into our eyes. And then our brains and minds begin starting to make sense of all these vibrations of light and air. And we gradually develop those capacities to know, to love, and to create which were the capacities that this immemorial being uh, used. It was those capacities that they had that caused that to reveal their beauty and to engrave upon us their image. So as humanity has progressed, we can come to see that beauty and to try to manifest that image according to our understanding. We get that understanding, again, through knowing ourselves. We get it also through creation, because God not only created us, this, and I'm using God. You can use another term, but God is the term that is most uh, accepted and most common in uh, Western society and for most of our audience, I guess. And so um, if you prefer immemorial being or ancient eternity of essence, uh, that's fine, but to use the more common language, uh, I'm using God. I know some people have some problems with uh, that language because, quite frankly, people who use the name God often use the name of God in vain. And by that, it's not the curse saying God. They use God's name to try and promote their own vain personal ambitions to to acquire power and, and wealth. And when people do that, rightly thinking and moral and uh, caring people are going to be repulsed because if that's what God is saying, give me your money, make me powerful and listen to uh, and, and close off your mind and, and just follow what I'm saying, follow me then they have a right to reject that God because that God is a false God. It is using the name of God in vain. It is an idol. And that's another one of the commandments you find throughout is not to worship false idols. And many people use the name of God actually in place of their false idols. They call it God, but it's actually a false idol. So I, many uh, very intelligent and very thinking people 
reject this idea of God because it's been associated with a lot of negative things. So uh, in any case, to, to get us back. So this immemorial being, this uh, God figure reveals this, but he also then made a covenant with mankind, with humanity, that not only would he reveal the beauty and engrave on his image, but he would send these messengers. He would reveal direct revelation, words of God through different teachers at different times as humanity progressed, very much like progressing in a school. So that you have your first grade teacher who's just as smart as the second grade teacher and just as good as the fourth grade teacher but is teaching the first graders according to what's timely and what's their capacity. And so it's important that you listen to your first grade teacher. That's the teacher, if that's where you are, you listen to the teacher of the grade you're in at that time. And we happen to be in the grade that Baha'u'llah is teaching right now. And so it's very important, it's essential actually, for human progress individually and collectively to, uh, to learn the lessons of Baha'u'llah because it's only those, le the lessons and the first and third and those grades, you, you're, don't go, you're not throwing them away, you're keeping those lessons. But now you've got to move to a higher level of understanding and operation, or else you won't progress. In other words, you can no longer act like a child. You're no longer, we are no longer children. We are also, we are kind of adolescents, but we, if Baha'u'llah has come to take us out of this adolescent stage and move us into our adulthood. So we're in a stage of transition now, which is these transitions, if you have been part of them, uh, well, we all have gone through them. We've all been adolescent. We've all been, uh, you know, going through these stages. Most of us have forgotten about them, but we may have children who remind us of them. But in any case, they are rather difficult. And at each stage, we have to move to a higher level of thinking, a higher level of, of being and of acting. And if we don't, I mean, if I'm here acting like a child, you would think, what are, even as an adolescent, you would not have any respect for me. Because, but if I was a child, you would say, oh, he's a child. Then we, we, have, to, we have to talk to him as a child. We have to teach him as a child. But now we're adults. We have to talk in adult language. We have adult responsibilities. Baha'u'llah brought the teachings that will enable us to get out of our adolescent, teenage kind of uh, stage that humanity's been in for the last few centuries and move into adulthood, which is really taking us from uh, practically from nation states, which are kind of each for themselves, to a world state where we are all, the world is one country and mankind its citizen. So to the short answer, the question is, you know, Baha'u'llah is the teacher we need to listen to. Obviously you can be good, but if you want to know the full truth, if you want to have the plan for moving yourself and humanity to the next stage in human uh, evolution and human civilization, then we need to listen to Baha'u'llah's teachings. You don't have to. I mean, you don't have to listen. You didn't have to listen to the DNA. The fortunate thing is, is we didn't get a chance to say, okay, I want eyes, or I'm not going to bother with eyes. The, God didn't give us that choice. That's the difference between the world of the womb and this world. In the world of the womb, we didn't have a choice. We had the DNA. The genes either expressed or didn't express the way they should, and we were born. Nobody came in and said, well, you can choose to develop this or not. 
we are now in position, this is something that's added to our souls in this world. We have been given free will. We don't have to believe in God. We don't have to believe in Baha'u'llah. We don't have to be good. We don't have to do, uh, you know, what, anything except what we're made to do by society. The rest of it is free. But the key is that if you don't, you're doing that at your own peril. And you won't recognize that peril here in this world. You won't recognize it until this placenta is removed and that embryo of your soul comes out of this body of humanity and all of a sudden is in this world of light that is all around it, but it doesn't, it can't see because we have this skin that keeps us from seeing it. Because if we could see it, we would not want to live here any longer. We would want to be in that world. Or some people would be so, you know, the people who uh, haven't developed their soul would probably be so affrighted they might die away in, in their uh, concern. So thank you for the question. I, I hope that's not too much or too little. Thank you so much, Rod. Uh, there are many questions uh, here uh, in the in the chat. I wanted. To, uh, I'm choosing uh, Mr. Abral. By the way, Mr. Abral, you haven't been here for a long time. Don't think that we don't know. We <laughs> know you haven't been here. He, he says the Hindu belief that after death we must take rebirth. 850 times to be reborn as a human, uh, my understanding is that these all take place in the womb from one cell, uh, from zygote to the full grown fetus. In reflection, killing lesser life forms would be a virtue which we know is not the will of the creator. Uh, Mr. Abral, if you want to add to it, you're more than welcome. I couldn't read one word, Z-Y-G-O-T-E. Zygote. Zygote, perfect, thank you. Yeah. So uh, Rod, because there are many questions, may I ask you to respond a little shorter? <laughs> No problem. Or, <laughs> how could you? <laughs> yes, I'll answer much shorter. You know, we don't know what the next world is like. And, and you know, obviously, if we don't know, the earlier stages of life, the earlier civilizations, the earlier prophets could not, if we are do not have the capacity to know that, they didn't have the capacity. And so, Every one of these is a story. I'm telling you a story because I don't know what the next life is like. Baha'u'llah made it clear, we cannot see it. We cannot know it. So we have to kind of go on a trust in the same way. If the embryo had a mind and will, it would have to go on the trust of, oh, well, I guess this is where the eye should go. I have. They would have no idea of knowing what and where to do it. So the different stories were suited for the time and capacity of the hearers of that age. And so the idea of, I'm just gonna use the one very short and of reincarnation is, is a very useful story. It, all of these stories are, have one real purpose and that is to awaken the individual to develop their spiritual qualities. So reincarnation is a good story for that. It's just a story. We don't know we, what story is going to most encourage you to, be, to develop the spiritual qualities so that when you do leave this world and go into the next. So others have stories of fire and brimstone. They are all stories. They are all in a way trying to appeal to our limited minds and capacities so that we will respond 
in a way that will be useful to us, our development here, so that when we do leave this world, we will be prepared. We do have uh, a question, probably from Malaysia. Uh, Saliga says, if our image and attributes come from God, but why each one have different attitudes? Uh-huh. Well, each one of us has a different body. Again, if we want to take with that, uh, that metaphor, all of our, our bodies actually came from that same God. 99% um, of our, what our bodies are is the same. The DNA, uh, we share 99% of that among ourselves. And it's the 1% that you can look at and say, oh, that's, that's Rod. Uh, and I can look at you and say, that's you. It's 1%. So that's another thing that's useful to think about. The next time you look at somebody and you think, well, they look kind of funny or uh, you know, you can't quite relate to them. They are only 1%, less than 1% different than you are. And the way, the way my genes expressed, I could have been a woman. Every gene in my body is the same. I could, but one thing triggered and I was born a man. I could have been born a woman. Uh, other things could have triggered and I would have been born different characteristics. Some things got expressed and didn't get expressed. The same thing is spiritually. We all have the same spiritual DNA, but each one of us is unique. Each one of us not only is unique physically, each one of us is unique spiritually. Each one of us has a special role and purpose to play in this creation. And it is our responsibility to take whatever we have been given to develop that and use it in service to humanity and God. And there is a verse in the Bible that says, for unto whomsoever much is given, so shall much be required. And, and we are given not only different things, but we're given different qualities of things, different volumes of things. Some of us have great capacity here spiritually, others have great capacity there. And we need to find our individual selves because it's, it's that unit in diversity. If every cell in our body became a fingernail cell, you got nothing. You, you want that diversity. It is the diversity that each one of you is different. Some of you are more eye cells, some of you brain, some of you heart, some of you stomach cells. And, and we can't be looking down and saying, oh, well, they're, they're in the intestine. Ay, ay, ay. Poor people. That intestine stops working. Goodbye, by heart and brain. It's all connected. You need all that diversity. And that is what, that's part of the beauty. He's revealed to us his beauty. The beauty is not only physical beauty, it is our spiritual beauty. We each have a different beauty and we each have, we can manifest those qualities. Again, I'm trying to be short for my dear sister. Thank you, thank you. By the so way- So she'll invite me back again. <laughs> <laughs> Before I read the other question, I wanted to welcome Empire from Congo. And I know how difficult it is for him to join us. But since he started his video, uh, Empire, give us a smile so we know you're happy. Thank you. If you have... Empire. You see Empire? He speaks your language. Did you hear that? I lived in I lived in Tanzania for three years, so I speak Swahili. But that was forty some years ago. <laughs> so yeah. and I have and I have a very I mean empire. I must tell you, I um, I w this is a story for all of you. But again, don't 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 beat me up for. Um, I lived in Tanzania. I was an auxiliary board member there and uh, hand of the cause. Um, 
Mohajir, who I just loved and, and admired so much, uh, came. And um, so I was meeting with him as the auxiliary board member. And we had a teaching conference. And uh, front, in that teaching conference were some new people. And they were refugees from the Congo. And uh, I just was so blown away. I said, who are, literally, who are these people? I've never seen people so spiritual, never. And um, the hand of the cause said, you know, I, and he, he of course traveled all over the world. And he said, there are only three places on earth that um, he thought there were true Baha'i villages, true Baha'i communities. One was Malaysia, to our Malaysian friends there. The other, or the other one I'm going to mention is the Congo. And, um, and of course we see that right now with, with the remarkable, remarkable fluorescence of the faith in, in that country. So just a shout out to my, my Indugo brother in uh, the Congo. <laughs> Empire, can you say something? Or you can't, the smile is enough. The smile is enough. That's, that's. No, no, he the... can, he can, he can. <laughs> It's okay. Um, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there are so many other questions that I would like. Yeah. Uh, Empire, we love you. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, and and uh, next time we will make sure that we can speak to each other. Mm. Okay, now. Uh, let me read for you a question which came uh from a friend is that I, I'm sorry there are so many questions is that can you talk about uh, the meeting with our loved ones in the next world yes um, Baha'u'llah says that we will commune with the souls in the next world uh, that we knew in this world, that we will be able to associate with them. Um, and those souls who are in the next world, we can associate with them right now. Our prayers, uh, they're, they're hearing us right now. This talk that I'm giving here is happening in the next world as well. It's happening though on a different level. It's happening on a spiritual level. You know, it's not the vibration of the tongue. It's not even the thoughts in the mind. It is the inner essence, that soul, that spiritual, the, we might think of it as the heart, the way that the hearts are moved. So you, you're, you're having a visual thing, you're having a mental thing, and you're having a spiritual experience. That spiritual experience is, is something that's happening in the next world. And so they are able to relate to it, but we can pray for them. They also are praying for us. You know, I'm writing this book. I've never been able to write before. Uh, even when I'm giving these talks, when I give these talks, it, I, it is not me that's speaking. I am so much relying on the inspiration from that next world. What should I say next? Well, I mean, how do I know what word? How do I know to answer these questions? Wh whether I should answer this way or that way? because there's many ways you could go, but I'm, I'm trying to rely on inspiration. I'm trying to have my ego be completely out, have my heart completely pure, so that, that whatever uh, is inspiring me, I, I, I will say it. And, so, and I'm trying, and that's now happening more with my writing. And so they, they are the leaven to this world. All of the things that happen in this world happen because of that world. In the world of the womb, all the good things that happen to you, all the nutrients you get, 
all the things that cause you to grow come from this world that you're not aware of. It comes through your mother, through that placenta into your embryo and it feeds you and you grow. Those souls in the next world are doing that now. Now, the one caveat I'll just say is that likewise in this world, you're going to be able to communicate and relate with the people on your same level and below, but the people below won't be able to communicate or really understand the people above them. It'd be like if I was in a, uh, a seminar with advanced physicists or mathematicians, and they were talking about some formula, uh, I could be there with them. And, but it's, they're not, uh, it's not helpful to me. They're, they're having, they're able to relate to one another, but I can't relate to them. You know, I'm not at that level. So that's just a, another quick example and answer. Thank you so much. There's another question uh, Afsun asked, can you speak about babies that die in the womb? When uh, the soul, when the soul is conceived, does the level of development of babies in the womb have any impact on their soul? Uh, definitely. What happens is that the the souls uh, who have not had the proper time to develop on this this stage of existence, because there is a reason for the soul coming here. In the same way, there's a reason that our bodies got developed. But what happens is they go to the next world and they are given the opportunities to develop those qualities there. There is a divine mercy, a divine, let's say, justice. So no, no person is going to be punished or are deprived of the right to develop. We all are going to have that right. The, the baby is not going to have anything to account for. They didn't do anything wrong. You and I have something to account for. We did something wrong. So they will be nurtured. Uh, some people compare it to a garden or, you know, that it's as a little seed that didn't get to sprout. It gets taken from here and transplanted into the garden and it's nurtured by those souls. Not only do we have jobs here, do we We have our souls have missions here. Our souls in the next world are not gonna be floating around on clouds and stuff. We are going to be also using all the spiritual attributes we developed here. And some of us will probably be nurturing those infant souls who didn't get the chance to develop in this world. And in some ways, it may be God's mercy. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. How do we develop our spiritual qualities and how do we progress and learn in the next world? And do we meet the prophets and messengers in the next world? Probably he does. We don't know. <laughs> uh... Those are three different questions. I'm going to start with the first one and then I'll let you decide if you want me to go on to the other two. Because uh, the first one, is, I'm going to try and be rather quick. I've often mentioned this in my other talks, but uh, if you read the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, which the House of Justice has done thoroughly, uh, they then summarized uh, the essential requisites for spiritual growth in a letter they wrote to the National Spiritual Assembly of Norway on September 1 of 1983. And those six requisites, I'm just going to speak very briefly. And if you have a piece of paper, you may want to write them down. Uh, and I'm going to give them to you in a way that is helpful because if you write it down and leave it, it's not going to help you. You need to be practicing these six requisites. These are requirements. The, you know, in their body, in the womb, you have certain requirements. If you don't get those requirements, your embryo isn't going to grow. You need to have the all those nutrients, the oxygen coming in, and you need to have all the waste products taken away. If that doesn't happen, you're going to suffer as an embryo. The same happens spiritually. 
So these are the spiritual nutrients and exercises, processes we need to go through to purify our souls, prepare our souls for the next world. So if you put them all together, the first initials spell the word prisms. A prism is, is like a, a glass that will break the white light into the various visible colors. So the P stands for prayer. We, every day we should be praying. And um, if you're a Baha'i, you should every day say the obligatory prayer. The R stands for reading. Every day you should be reading the sacred scriptures. This is the word of God. This is that thing that feeds us. This is what we need to develop ourselves. This is the instruction manual. This is what says, uh, develop this here and this here. Got to follow it. Go to it every day, every morning, every evening. The I stands for instruct or inspire or teach. Once you have learned these things, you can't keep it to yourself. You have to share it. You have to tell other people. You have to help other people come to realize it. You have to inspire them to awaken their souls. You have to instruct them on how they can they can process all of this and, and prepare themselves for the next world. The S is for service. You need to serve. So you, every day you have to find some way that you can serve humanity. Every action you do, you could, should think about how is this service to God and humanity. The M stands for meditation. When you pray and you read, you need to meditate. These three things are like the food for your soul. If you're not feeding your soul, the exercise you do by teaching and, and serving, you're going you're gonna to wear out. And if you're just eating, praying, reading, and uh, uh, meditating and not exercising, you also are going to get fat and lazy and not be healthy. And the last S stands for striving. And I leave that last because it's one of the most kind of comprehensive because we have to strive to that to reveal that beauty that's within us. We have to strive to manifest all the attributes of God that have been engraved on our soul. That's a daily practice. Every one of those is a daily practice. They are essential. If you don't get them, you're going to suffer. Uh, if you don't get your essentials in the womb, think about that. So, Farouz, I'm back to you. Dr. I'm sorry. Uh, th there's another uh, question. If the next world is full of mercy, compassion, love, and forgiveness of sins for all, then does our re relative... Uh, failure to develop virtues really have an uh, impact? This is a bit of a facetious question. I am really just trying to understand the purpose of tests, which is yeah. mostly how we develop virtues. I think probably you said that. In understanding the nature of this world versus the next world. Thank you. This is a fascinating topic. Thank you. Uh, it's not just a world of mercy. It's a world of justice. This is a world of justice as well. And we, we have to hope for God's mercy, but we cannot count on it. Uh, it'd be like in the, in the uh, world of the womb saying, well, I'm not going to develop eyes because when I get to the next world, they're, they're going to have some, they're going to have mercy on me and they're going to, transplant some eyes in me and I'm going to, so I don't need to worry about that here. It doesn't work that way. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's justice and, uh, and you count on the mercy, but God is a, is a God of both justice and mercy. Thank you. There is uh, a question, an interesting question the veil of hinderness that interposes between soul and body 
during physical disease is sickness itself. Shoghi Effendi, the compilation of compilations, volume one, uh, paragraph 478. Can you elaborate on this view? Thank you. I don't, I didn't, I don't really understand it. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe, uh, is it, is it about the soul being, I, I don't understand the, the quotation. You know, uh, this is one of those quotations that you need to know before and after. It's just taken and maybe I can send it to you and. Okay. You, you can, if you answer, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to others. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, because I don't, I don't understand it. Okay. I can't, I can't tell you, I'm making a guess that is, and I might get to that a little bit, is that our uh, soul is completely exalted above and independent of our bodies and minds. And so say I'm born with a body and a mind that can't function or as my body and mind right now are dying. Uh, they've been dying for a number of years. You know, I've had cancer. I've had a stroke. Uh, I am, if I'm weaker and weaker every year. Um, my mind is less agile every year. I am dying. But my soul is not dying. My soul is independent of that. It's exalted above it. And in fact, I believe this dying of my body and my mind is a gift from God. Because it is helping me to say, if you're worried about this and this, your day's over. Those days, you should have those days are 20 years ago. Now, no matter how much I work this or I work this, I'm never going to be where I was 20 years ago. I need to be working on the soul. And because I know this is a throwaway body and my mind is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, is fading away as well, I'm going to... I, I'm focusing more and more on my soul. You know, don't lay up your treasures here. Thank you. Uh, another question. Isn't the mind the faculty of the soul? Well yes. done, Sean. Yes, it is. And in fact, uh, one of the things to think about um, just as our body has all of these diverse uh, aspects to it, our souls do as well. You know, our bodies have a brain, our bodies have a mouth, our bodies have eyes and ears and arms and legs. Our souls have the equivalent of those things. So our souls are going to be manifesting, you know, the part of our our mind that is worldly and is connected with the brain won't be there. Uh, it's the part that it's that inner voice, that mind that when you sit and you're meditating and it's like, Oh, you know, it, you're, you're connected. You, you see your vision. Isn't this vision. It isn't this vision. You're not thinking about it. Your inner eye, your inner vision sees it. Your inner mind knows it. So this vision, this ear, all of these things are attributes of the soul. My using my mouth, my words, is a manifestation of my soul. It's my soul that's instructing my this, you know, move your tongue, move this, say these words now, put this sentence together. It's my soul that's doing that. That's the part that's going to go on. My mouth doesn't go on. My brain speaking in English isn't going to go on. You know, my but the 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 ideas, the the mind, that inner mind is what lives on. And that's what I'm going to that's who's going to be communicating with the next world. Don't be looking for this. Thank Sorry, you. I go too long again. 
you've made me so self-conscious for verse. Thank you, Rod. Empire has a question and he's showing his face. Go for it. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Yeah, and I from this talk I understand that the 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 important thing is the soul and we have to to we have to feed it with the 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 the, the div with the 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 this the, the the text of the manifestation of God. And yeah. uh, so uh, my question was uh, what is the importance of the cemetery? Is it our last address in this world? or just the proof of our passing in this world because uh, after after dying the the body become useless we bury it but sometimes we go there to 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 pray for the people who died if they was our friends our parents or thing like that or we can only bury them and uh, start be praying for them even at home without going to to see their grave and uh, to you know, we go there, we we remove the... the uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, Malia Majani. The, 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 because the soul was associated with this body, we treat it with respect. And we should, I mean... Part of our spiritual development is treating our soul with respect. One of the metaphors uh, or analogies that Abdul Baha uses is that the soul is like the rider and the body is like the horse or the donkey or whatever, whatever you're riding, could be a car. Uh, you are not you are not the horse, but you depend upon that horse to move you about. I depend on this horse to speak, to, to see, to, to operate in this world. If I don't have it, I'm not gonna operate. If I have a stroke that debilitates me, uh, this body and mind is not gonna do me any good here. My soul will not be able to manifest the beauty of God, whatever, through this instrument, which is like, your computer or your radio. It's it's receiving it's receiving the waves from me here in the Virgin Islands all the way to the Congo. And it is not your computer that I'm in. If your computer gets broken, I'm still here speaking. Or if you lose the signal, I'm still the soul is still operating. The transmission and, and vehicle are different. So the reason we we honor the body because it was associated with the soul. The soul is not associated with the body after it dies. Once you have died, your soul is, and there's a lot of life after death or near death experiences that you can read about that kind of describe that a little bit. But we do that, and in fact, the Baha'i writings uh, say you need to bury in a casket and not, you know, and say prayers and all of these things because we do uh, respect the body. I think going to the grave is, is more for our own satisfaction. I know many people, you know, one of the teachings of the Baha'i faith is to bury with one, one hour. And some Baha'is have had a, a real hard time with that because they wanted their loved one buried near to them. And they've been assured that your loved one is near to you. It doesn't matter where their body is. So again, I'm shortening the answer for my dear sister. Empire. You can ask any other question you want. We have six more minutes or five more minutes, and I have a question myself. So she lets Empire speak, but she cuts me short. Because Empire, it's very <laughs> nice for Empire to be here. I don't know the time of, yes. uh, you know, of Congo and everything. And I know that there are internet problems. That's very yeah. nice of him to participate. 
I'm very happy. Something. So th th thank you. It is the 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 only question I had for today. Okay. <laughs> well, but I, but I would say because you mentioned your parents, it's very important that we pray for our parents, and um, as they will be praying for us in the next world, uh, there is a special bond, a special degree of respect. But you know where their body is laid, uh, and we will go there as a way of respecting. I mean. In this world, we respect one another by using our bodies. And so we respect them by going to their place where they're buried. But it isn't necessary. They're not there. We, we go there partly for our own uh, psychic satisfaction. And, but as it's also a symbol, it, it's a reminder. Just as we turn towards the, the bhaji for saying our prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clarkin. If there is no more question, I have a question, and then we will move to our devotions. Right. Um, you know, uh, Abu Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, when he was in California, he went to visit Torrington Chase's uh, resting place. And then yep. he asked the friends there, the Baha'is, to go there and pay their respect. Is there anything you would like to, to say about this? Yeah, not only that, but we go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land to pray at the grave sites, the tombs of, uh, of our central figures. Uh, not only do we go there, but in our obligatory prayers, daily we are to turn to that site wherever we are in the world we turn towards that site as a token of our respect and devotion and 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 because we are in these physical bodies it's by doing those physical acts it's our soul that's saying body get off your couch stand up go wash your hands and face and say this prayer it's say it's, it's that soul saying body do these things your body doesn't wants to stay on the couch your body doesn't want to get up uh and your mind may want to stay on the couch or you may your mind may want to play tick tock on some game or something i don't know what they do <laughs> but but no your soul has to develop its muscle your soul has to say, no body, we're not listening to you. No mind, you're not in charge of me. I'm in charge of telling the mind and the body what to do, not you telling me what to do. And see, that's the great challenge in life. We start off with life, our body telling us what to do. When we're hungry, we scream. When we need to go to the bathroom, we go to the bathroom. We do whatever our body tells us to do. As we grow older, we are able to have our mind say, okay, now's not, we should, just because I'm hungry, it doesn't mean I need to throw a tantrum and, and scream on the floor and stuff. You know, and then as we get further, our souls then be able to say, okay, body, you're, I'm not the slave to you. I'm not your servant. You are my servant. You're going to do what I want you to do. And so going to these holy places, they do have a special significance and they do affect our souls. Just the mere act of my getting up off my couch, doing my ablutions, turning, saying the prayer, it has an effect on my soul because I've just exercised my soul. My soul has just developed a quality and the words I say, because I'm saying them in obedience to this immemorial being, those are going to have a transformation. They're going to help develop my soul in the same way that all of my uh, cells are saying, okay, we're going to express this now. We're going to develop this. It's, it's all part of that process. Thank you so very much. Mm. 
Dr. Clarkin. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Has I appreciate you. So ah. any time we ask him to help, he's always there. Very grateful to you, Dr. Clarkin. Thanks a million. Thank you. With Thank your you. permission, uh, if, if we can start our devotions till nine o'clock, uh, is it okay for you, Ra? Of course, yeah. Empire, would you want to be the first one to pray? We do have uh, Empire uh, and uh, Miss Shaw, Chinese, Salige Aziz. She will, uh, she's, she joined us from Malaysia. Are you still here? And Pina and Tara, uh, anyone else, please? Uh, Please uh, let us know. By the way, Genus writes, thank you. A wonderful and beautiful talk. So Saliga, why don't you go first? Please, thank you so much for your wonderful question as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. Let's pray. Avare sarva volimaya manavar in prabhuye in Arasare, in Archialare, in the Ira Yanmi, in the Navin Alum, in the Ullat Alum, in the Anmavin Alum, um, my Yuvar, Vendi Alekindi, um, the Yuvuli, um, the Beni Gatel in um, Ara in Alum, um, the Tavara, Udevi in um, Angi in Alum, um, the Paduka in um, Kavasatalum, and Ivi P. Paga, um, Umadu Makali de Umay Patri with Cherry Kabum, Umadu Nadgunangale Potri Dabum, Avarak Udavidivi Raga, Umadu Vutrume Punida Tayum Potri Pad Vadar Kana, Over Sabayum, Umadu Magimeyum Pugalayum Uraitida, Avaradinave Talatidivi Raga, Umayagave, Nire Vallaver, Sativa in the Ver, Ulimayaman Aver, Suaji Vian Aver, Abdul Baha. Is it me? Um, I am in China. Uh, Wenzhou, my hometown, where I become Baha'i 31 years ago here, wow. through the pioneer to China, a Dutch lady. So I'm really emotional. I hope you allow me to say, to say two short prayer. Um, First is uh, in Chinese, bless is a spot. Um, 祝福在此地, 在乌语, 在大地, 在城市, 在心里, 在商脉, 在避难所, 在洞穴, 在古地, 在大地, 在海洋, 在岛屿, 在绿岩, and the second prayer is the first prayer I, Baha'i prayer, I memorize, a very short one for children. Oh God, guide me, protect me. <laughs> um, I felt no matter how old I am, when I say this prayer, I'm forever this little kid looking for guidance and protection. Um, 上帝啊, 指引我, 保护我, 使我成为, 明亮的灯和灿烂的心，您是全能者，全权者。That's so wonderful that you joined us from China. You know we love you. Would you like to say a prayer for your Dutch teacher who taught you the faith? Bless her heart. Yes, her name is Barbara Stefan. Um. She was in U.S. in 92 uh, in this big gathering in New York, and she rise up to the call to the pioneer to China. I met her in 93. Um, I was a student in the university here. Um, it's just uh, 
uh, so wonderful that uh, um, <clears throat> she was sponsored by a Dutch lady, Loti Tobias, who was one of the early, earliest Baha'i in Holland. She said, I'm older, I cannot travel. If someone can travel on my behalf and I will support financially. And that's how this whole uh, community, <laughs> and uh, I felt extremely fortunate, you know, I, I become Baha'i the moment I heard the name of Baha'u'llah. And, uh, and I, I, I sensed, I said, wow, Baha'u'llah, that's my first conversation. You sent her all the way from Holland to me. You know, I felt really special. And, uh, um, you know, there are many, many Baha'is in China. Um, it's just wonderful. Chinese people are so um, connect with Baha'i teaching. It's rooted in our culture and history. You know, the Taoism, the Confucian, and it's all talking about the same thing. And uh, for me, the biggest uh, take uh, touched me is the progressive liberation because I was a struggle with the different religions, the different settings and the different ways of worship and they don't unify, you know, I felt the conflict because in um, daily life, they are all wonderful, uh, kind people. I don't know in their belief why there's a, some sort of a, um, um, criticism or conflict, you know, so that was my struggle. And uh, when I found a Baha'i face, it, it just, I felt such a freedom, you know, such a um, harmony, it, it bring, it really bring peace to my heart. And it's, that's, you know, the, the biggest um, change in my life. I quickly adopted the concept of a world citizen. <laughs> and uh, I break through, you know, uh, uh, this one country, I look out to the world and I go study in the Netherlands and I lived in US and uh, I make friends, you know, all around the world. And uh, it's just really, really special. Thank you so much, Shu. Thank you. I was wondering if you can uh add your email address for me in chat one more time i would like probably to have a, a session with the friends who became a baha'i in different countries and i would like you please to to yes that. yes that be fine yeah. i'll you, do that right now <laughs> i want to say a prayer for uh for your uh teacher i know uh go ahead please i know mrs tobias very well my sister was a pioneer to uh, to Holland for 53 years. So I know Mrs. Tobias very well. Thank you for bringing the name of these people. Yes, uh, I will say a prayer for the departed because Mrs. Tobia and uh, Barbara Stefan and they all has passed to the next world. Um, let me... Quickly found one. Um. Well, thank you so much. She make me cry. She talked about China because I live there and she said so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is a prayer for the departed. Please go. Ahead. 在您独一性的门前，他的地位多么卑微，但他精心您和您的经文见证您的圣言。他为您的爱国所点燃，沉浸于您知识汪洋的深处，迷恋你恩慈的微风。他信任你，仰望着你，向您请愿，确信已被您
不朽天国，指望张扬明的圣言。主啊，荣耀他的身份吧，以您至高恩宠的停格保护他，让他进入你荣耀天堂。在您高贵的玫瑰园中永享芬芳，使他置身于那神秘世界，沉浸于光明之阳，承认您是慷慨者、强力者、宽恕者、施予者。阿布杜巴。Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much. We love you. I'm wondering if Tara, Tara, are you there? Okay. I saw she was there. Yes, she's Tara is here. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Sorry. Hello, is it Zora Nini? And this prayer is about unity, it's from Abdul Baha. تا 
به قوت ملکوتی و نفسات روح القدس فریاد توی مقتده و عزیز و توانا و توی دانا و شنوا و بینا عبدالبها عبا Here is a prayer, removal of difficulties in Kiswahili, where my first child was born in 1980 in Tanzania. <speaking in Spanish> Isi poku wa mwenyezi mungu Sema mwenyezi mungu na sifiwe Yeye mwenyezi mungu Wote ni watu mishi wake Na wote wanaishi kwa mapense yake. Tepa. Empire, would you like to say a prayer, please? Ne retiens pas mon Dieu loin de moi. Ne brise douce de ton pardon et de ta grâce. Ne me prive pas des sources jaillissantes de ton aide et de tes faveurs. Oh Dieu, mon Dieu, ne retiens pas mon Dieu loin de moi. Ne brise douce de ton pardon. Et de ta grâce, et ne me prive pas des sources jaillissantes, de ton aide et de tes faveurs. Oh Dieu, mon Dieu, délie ma langue, oh mon Dieu, pour louer ton don, au milieu de ton père, afin que ma voix s'élève. Dans des grandes ensembles qui démêlèvent, s'écoule ta louange, délie ma langue, oh mon Dieu, pour louer ton nom, au milieu de ton peuple, afin que ma voix s'élève. Dans des grandes ensembles qui démêlèvent, Before oh, go ahead, go ahead, Leo. Please go ahead, Juliet. Please go ahead. Dan telinga yang mendengar, 
Bukalah pintu pengertian sebenar dan dia yang cahaya keimanan bersinar dengan gilang gemilang. Thank you very much. May I ask Mrs. Hissing uh, to say a prayer, probably a healing prayer for Maria, who is joining us from the hospital, please. Mrs. Yi Sing, I probably, I'm not pronouncing her name uh, well, or maybe yes. Thank you. Thank you. Are you talking to me? A prayer would be fine. Thank you. Yes, she is. Thank you. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God. And remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope. And love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily art the all bountiful, the all knowing, the all wise. Baha'u'llah. Wow, beautiful. Wow. Felicity, you collect the, all the beautiful old flowers from around the world in the garden of Baha'u'llah. So beautiful, spiritually meeting. That P9, she was 45 years ago with me in Laotian camp. She speaks Laotian. 400 people become Baha'i in Laotian, Laotian camp and Pinang taught the faith to them. Oh my God, genius. This is the, this is the miracle of Baha'u'llah. All the people from around the world, Baha'i. Ya Baha'u'llah. Sorry, without permission, I talk. You need, you need no permission. Uh, Pina speaks and say prayers in 200 different languages. And I, I always ask her not to, to say a prayer in Farsi because we have so many others who speak in, in Farsi, but <laughs> Tara is laughing. Uh, but anyways, by the way, uh, Mr. S uh, Mr. Y H S I, Mr. Sings, if you want to put your uh, your email address in the chat, I would be more than glad to send you the invitation. Mr. Perimal, am I pronouncing the name? Do you know these friends? I think he did put the, the uh, email address, right? Yes, the yes. Secret, Mr. Yixing. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Mr. Hissing. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Hissing. I appreciate it. Uh, I Before we uh, close the meeting with Mr. Tahir Zadeh, I wanted to thank very much uh, Maria, who joined us uh, from Port Perry. I would like her to know that she will be in our prayers uh, and healing prayers will be said for her. And please let us know how you will be doing. I would be more than glad to send you invitation for next week and the weeks after that. And we love you. And we know that this thing will finish sooner than you think. Mr. Jeeva, thank would you, you like thank to you say so much? Thank you very much to everybody. You're very welcome. You have a whole world behind you. Thank you. Mr. Jiva, would you like to say a prayer? No? Okay. I understand. I, okay, so uh, 
other than Mr. Taherzadeh, if anybody else would like to say a prayer, you're more than welcome. Mr. Taherzadeh would be the last one. It's an assistant prayer in Tamil language. Oh, okay, perfect. And maybe I can say a prayer too. Um, I'm just going to say this prayer for my dad who passed away uh, 37 years ago, but four days ago. <laughs> um, and he was... Um, he was put in prison in, in Iran and he was beaten up really badly and uh, in a way that they had beaten his legs, uh, the doctor said he's going to lose the use of his muscles um, and then that's going to um, take his life away. And it did, it did happen. Um, and he was such a sweet man, sweet, sweet man. Uh, and I just want to share this prayer um, with you. Uh, it's for him and for anybody else that wants to keep their dads or mom or loved ones who are in next world in mind. Jean Rusun, would you like to say the last name of your dad, please? Yes, sure. Um, his name is Misawala and last name was Taifi. Yeah. What are you talking about? Thank you. And he was actually one of the reasons why the, he was put Still in prison was because they were wondering why he had um, brought up a girl that wouldn't recant her faith because she was also my sister was put in prison for many years so yeah long story um so this is a prayer for for him and our for our loved ones the next world my god oh my god verily thy servant humble before the majesty of thy divine supremacy lowly at the door of thy oneness, had believed in thee and in thy verses, had testified to thy word, had been enkindled with the fire of thy love, had been immersed in the depths of the ocean of thy knowledge, had been attracted by thy breezes, had relied upon thee, had turned his face to thee, had offered his supplications to thee, and had been assured of thy pardon and forgiveness. He had abandoned this mortal life and had flown to the kingdom of immortality, yearning for the favor of meeting thee. O oh Lord, glorify his station. Shelter him under the pavilion of thy supreme mercy. Cause him to enter the, thy glorious paradise and perpetrate his existence in thine exalted rose garden, that he may plunge into the sea of light in the world of mysteries. Verily, thou art the generous, the powerful, the forgiver, and the bestower. Abdul Baha. Thank you very much, Jinus John. I think you said that not only for your parents, but for all the Baha'is in Iran who are undergoing such a persecution. We appreciate it, Jinus John. Thank you so much. We will close this wonderful meeting with Mr. Tahir Zadeh from Michigan. Thank you. Aray Tahir Zadeh, please go ahead. From the hidden words, revealed by Baha'u'llah. O son of spirit, the bird seeketh its nest, the nightingale, the charm of the rose, whilst those birds the hearts of men, content with transient dust, have strayed far 
from their eternal nest. And with eyes turned towards the slough of heedlessness, are bereft of the glory of the divine presence. Alas, how strange and pitiful for a mere cupful they have turned away from the billowing seas of the Most High and remain far from the most effulgent horizon. O oh, ye people that have minds to know and ears to hear, the first call, the first call of the beloved is this. O oh, mystic nightingale, abide not but in the rose garden of the spirit. O oh, messenger of the Solomon of love, seek thou no shelter except in the Shiva of the well-beloved. And O oh, immortal phoenix, dwell not save on the Mount of Faithfulness. Therein is thy habitation, if on the wings of thy soul thou soarest to the realm of the infinite and seekest to attain thy goal. O son of man, thou art my dominion, and my dominion perisheth not. Wherefore fearest thou thy perishing? Thou art my light, and my light shall never be extinguished. Why dost thou dread extinction? Thou art my glory, and my glory fadeth not. Thou art my robe, and my robe shall never be outworn. Abide then in thy love for me, that thou mayest find me in the realm of glory. Rod, thank you so very much for this beautiful talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, I want to thank every one of you for joining us tonight to make this space beautiful, warm, and cozy. Uh, Tara, it was heavenly. Whenever you, you sing, it's always heavenly. Even Mr. Tahirza, they always ask me if Tara is coming or not. Anyways, uh, love you all. Thank you. Shaw, we love, love, love you. Uh, I will learn Chinese in order to tell you I love you. And I would love to have you as our speaker. Uh, Mr. Liu, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Neely, I appreciate it. Mr. Hissing, thank you. I apologize if I don't say your name, pronounce your names well. And um, so 
uh, next week. Thank you to thank you for opening your uh, camera. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Singh. I appreciate it. Uh, Empire, great, Mr. Abril. I will send you the link you wanted. Uh, give me a, a little bit of time. Uh, and thank you very much. Lovely talk. God bless. God bless. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, uh, well, uh, Mr. Jiva, Jinus Khanum, all of you, Mr. Uh, or Mrs. Art Davio, Amali June, uh, and uh, Simin June, uh, two Simins, Galaxy A525G, Maria, if you're still here, Motorella, you. you're very welcome. Are you happy, Maria? Very happy. Thank you so much. It's just wonderful. Um, it's wonderful to know so many people and prayers. It's just, it's uh, it's heaven on earth. <laughs> that's that's great. Thank you for joining in, and and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. All the best. Allah Hafiz. Bye. Bye. Allah Hafiz. Bye. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Thank you. Shaje she she vo aini. Shaje she she vo aini. From China. Russia. Vo aini. Vo aini. I love you. Anybody girl come to Bahai house of worship. I should have shaje she she vo aini. They love it. Fari de Jun, I need to learn all the languages you know. It is not only one language, but I'll do my best. Yeah, learn from the uh, Pinai. <laughs> I know only <laughs> few. I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Thank Good you night. for those Hanum. Thank you so much. Much love. قربون اون صدات برم تارا قربون اون شکل خودت برم تارا فداتون بشم من فدات بشم عزیزم حالا که کسی نیست قربون صدقت میرم عزیزم رنگ سرتم عالی شده اینو بیشتر دوست دارم it's gorgeous old شده مرسی عالی that's it همین باید باشه قربون ات برم فداتون بشم من میگم همه زحمات برنامه فوق العاده فروز جان برم همه از قلب تراوش میکنه به فدای من به فدای تو بشم عزیزم اوکی می بوسم بای بای سیمین جان دو تا سیمین جان هفت جان مرسی فدایش